I'm going to be talking on uh, work um, by, by these people, Roland, myself, Lance, uh, Victor, Anthony, Natalie, Atul, David, and, and Kayu. Um, so, <clears throat> so I think as everybody knows, you know, QCD amplitudes are really, really hard to compute. And, you know, many people have listed a tiny number here, but, you know, huge numbers of people have worked very hard to compute, say, massless QCD amplitudes. And roughly the range we have is the following. At tree level, there's a ton of information. One loop, we have endpoint amplitudes. At two loop, I think it's about seven points. Um, maybe it's a bit further. <clears throat> so what I want to talk about today is so a, a new method which computes very, very special amplitudes in massless QCD using Chiron algebras. So what's good about this method is that you can go a bit further than what's been known before in the special cases to which it applies. So in particular, we can get formula for endpoint two loop all plus amplitudes in mass plus QCD with certain special matter content. Um, so Lance and Anthony uh, were able to check that if you use the standard techniques, up to some subtleties with dim reg, this, if, you know, our result does match what you find in the standard techniques at uh, four points. But, yeah. <clears throat> so the starting point for our analysis, well, actually, yes. So maybe take away if you're going to fall asleep for the rest of the talk, is that a very small subsector of QCD with special matter is exactly solvable. It has some integrable structures. So this is, a, you know, it's a small subsector. It's limited in how far you can go in the loop number and in what holistic configurations. But it's still not zero. And there's a hidden algebraic structure, which in this subsector allows you to do loop level computations exactly. And all of this comes from the relation to twister space. OK. <clears throat> so the starting point of our analysis is something which I think is familiar to many people, but I'll review it anyway, which is that we can view QCD as a deformation of self-dual QCD. So this was, has been studied since at least the 90s. Self-dual QCD has this Lagrangian. I introduce a Lagrange multiplier field B, whose equations of motion enforce the self-duality equations for the field strand. And also, I have a usual, the matter appears in the usual way. And if I take this simple Lagrangian and I deform it by adding trace B squared, then it's equivalent to ordinary QCD in perturbation theory. And this is a very well known thing. And the equivalence is simply once I had on trace B squared, you integrate at B and you're left with the usual Lagrangian. It's very simple. So I'm, I'm interested in doing computations uh, in self dual QCD in low orders in this perturbation given by this term. Um, so it'll be helpful to draw some pictures of what Feynman diagrams in self dual QCD look like. self dual QCD has a vertex, which is plus, plus, minus. We think of B as being a negative velocity state, and A is positive. So I have a plus plus minus vertex and a minus plus propagator. I'm going to draw the direction that this helicity goes by this arrow. And adding trace p squared introduces a, a vertex like this, because it's, it's a minus minus vertex. Um, so you can study QCD in perturbation theory around the self field sector, and many people have done this. So, oops. Yeah, here we go. Um, this is a popular thing to do around 2005. 
if I just insert one copy of trace B squared, then this is what people would call the MHV vertex. And if I insert many copies, then well, you can try to glue them together at tree level by the CSW rules. And you know, it's related to the integrand people like to study in N equals four. So what I want to do is to apply a similar program, but to non-supersymmetric theories at loop level. So for today, I'm going to be interested in what happens if I insert one copy of trace B squared. So I'm deforming away from the self dual sector to first order. And what you find without supersymmetry, form factors of this operator in the self dual theory are massless QCD amplitudes up to two loops with two minus L states of negative velocity. Okay. Um, so I'll draw a picture to illustrate why this is true. When I'm building Feynman diagrams in the self dual theory, every vertex has two incoming ROs and one outgoing RO. That makes it really hard to build any complicated diagrams. The combinatorics tells me you stop at one loop. However, if I add on a vertex which acts as a source, this vertex here is a trace B squared, that allows me to go one loop further. <clears throat> so diagrams like this, they compute the form factors of trace B squared in the self dual theory, but they also compute the two loop all plus amplitudes in ordinary QCD. This is because adding on this trace B squared is what deforms me from the self dual theory to the folk. So you can ask what other things does the self dual theory know about at loop level? If I added on a more complicated vertex like trace B to the N, then the self dual theory knows about things at higher loop orders. <clears throat> so trace B to the N will tell me about the form factors of trace of F minus to the N at loops up to N loops. For example, here is a picture of trace B cubed. And you can see from the combinatorics, this is a source for the solicity. And I can build a, two, a three loop all plus diagram. <clears throat> So this is a thing which the self dual theory knows about. So the, the, the aim in, in this, this talk of this program is to compute form factors in the self dual theory. And we see from these pictures, they know about some low loop number uh, QCD things, which tend to have lots of external positive velocity states. Um, maybe there's one more thing I should say if we go back. Going back to this diagram, I didn't draw the picture of what happens at tree level, but if you were to cut two of these edges, you would see that things like this at tree level have two external negative velocity states. So at tree level diagrams like this will give you the Park-Taylor formula. So if I want to compute the one and two level form factors of this operator, you should have in mind that this is a natural loop level completion of the Park-Taylor expression. So for most of the talk, I'll be aiming at explaining like the two, two loop term, which is the two loop completion of the Park-Taylor. Okay, so. Uh, So the main result of this talk is that when the matter we work with, matter content satisfies this identity, the trace of x to the fourth in the matter representation is trace of x to the fourth in the adjoint representation, then these form factors that we've been discussing are the same as correlators of a 2D chiral algebra. Now, by a chiral algebra, I mean we take a familiar 2D CFT and look at the structure of the holomorphic part. So we have operator product expansions, which are holomorphic functions of position, and they satisfy associativity across crossing symmetry. 
a particular consequence of this is that when this holds, then these form factors are all rational functions of the, of the kinematics. Okay. So this is a bit of a strange condition, and I'll explain in a minute where it comes from. But here are some examples. Like one can take SU2 with NF equals 8, SU3, NF equals 9. And well, this pattern continues, but perhaps not in the way you expect. The continuation is SUN with this matter. Here is NF equals 8, and then I have to add on the exterior square of the fundamental. The exterior square means the anti-symmetric part of F tensor F. So for example, if N is 3, then this piece here is just another copy of fundamental plus anti-fundamental. And if n is 2, this is just um, a singlet and can be ignored. So I'm going to mostly focus on these examples, but it, it's, and this cancellation also holds for any supersymmetric theory. The reason I don't, I don't want to study a supersymmetric theory is that most of the natural, the amplitudes we, we, we are studying are all zero in any supersymmetric theory. Like the two loop all plus amplitude vanishes. Okay, so where does this condition come from? Well, as I'm sure many people have heard since Penrose's work in the 60s it, and the work of uh, Ward in the 70s, it's been known that there's a very close relation between self-duality and twister space. So in particular, uh, these self-dual Langmills theories can be lifted to a theory on twister space. Now, twister space is six dimensional. And the higher in dimension you go, the more gauge anomalies you see. And in six dimensions, one sees box anomalies like this. So this identity is what's needed to guarantee the absence of a box anomaly in twister space. And so it guarantees that, that our theory is a local theory on twister space. Now, on space-time, there is no such anomaly. So this is not a gauge anomaly on space-time. Instead, it's an anomaly to integrability. One can show the, the, the twister anomaly vanishing. That happens if and only if the one-loop all-plus amplitudes vanish. So this connects to some old observation by Bardeen in the 90s that the one-loop all-plus amplitudes were an obstruction to integrability of self-dual theories. Um, I should point out, this identity holding, you know, it's an abstract result from twister theory that this identity implies the one loop all plus amplitudes vanish. Now suppose you forget about twister theory and you go to compute the one loop all plus amplitudes in a theory satisfying this identity. They are not obviously zero, but they are zero through some kind of rather non-trivial kinematic identities. This was studied by um, Lance and Anthony, and hopefully their paper on this will be out uh, soon. Okay, so I should mention that this, what we're studying has some relationship with celestial holography. So we like to call this algebra the celestial chiral algebra because it can be viewed as living on the celestial sphere. So unlike ordinary holography, celestial holography not really settled down into kind of kind of uniformly accepted way of, of proceeding and uniformly accepted language. So the approach we're taking here is a little different from what some people do. So well I should mention if we just look at positive city states, the chiral algebra we study was previously studied by Guevara, Himwich, Peyton, Strominger. Um, in some approaches to celestial holography, they like to introduce an anti chiral sector too. We do not like to do that. Most of the time, if you give me a random quantum field theory and try to say, well, is there a, some 2D CFT whose correlators are amplitudes of your quantum field theory? Most of the time, this is not possible for a local CFT. So some people like to relax locality, but we don't. So because we only study local CFTs, these celestial algebras we're, we're studying, they're extremely special. 
They only exist for very special theories, and it's related to integrability. Okay, so let me try to tell you a little bit about how to how to build the chiral algebra. Um, well, everybody knows the spinner helicity formalism that a momentum null momentum can be written as a product of two spinners, lambda and lambda tilde. So the chiral algebra is going to live on a plane, a complex plane or CP1, whose coordinate is given by one of those spinners. So we can scale lambda so that it's a form one comma z, so z then z is a point in CP1, and the chiral algebra lives on this plane. But states are operators of the chiral algebra at this point on the, on the plane where it lives will, will be gauge theory states whose momentum has lambda equals z and lambda tilde arbitrary. So in other words, states of the chiral algebra are just states of gauge theory, except that part of the momentum of your gauge theory state is going to be encoded in where I am on this plane. So, for example, I'm going to have an operator j plus lambda tilde of z, where lambda tilde is a parameter, z is where I am on, the, on this chiral algebra plane, and similarly for the negative helicity states. And I can expand these in series in lambda tilde, get currents j and n. Now, these currents will, will be the, the generators for my chiral algebra. So I'm going to have similar currents for matter fields and for negative velocity gluons, so that the general local operator of my chiral algebra is given by some normally ordered product of these currents. So again, if this is going too fast, the, the key point is that an operator in the chiral algebra is essentially a state in my, in my gauge theory. So the dictionary is going to be the following. So states will be operators, as I said. Form factors of self-dual QCD are going to be correlation functions of the chiral algebra. And collinear singularities are going to be operator product expansions. So for the next couple of slides, what I'm going to do is explain this. We'll take familiar formula formulae for collinear singularities and then just turn them into definitions of OPEs. So for example, let's work at tree level. So this blob represents some operator in self dual QCD, and I'm maybe studying some four-point form factor. When these two positive velocity gluons their momentum becomes collinear. Of course, we get a pole which looks like this, one over one, two. So this is translated into a chiral algebra statement by saying, if I take j plus times j plus, their OPE has a one over one, two pole, where one, two is z one minus z two, times j plus. So the translation between the tree level splitting function and the chiral algebra OPE is it's just a very trivial translation. Similarly, there's going to be a minus plus to minus OPE, but it's crucial that the self dual theory is, is very chiral. So negative velocity and positive velocity gluons are treated very differently. So there is no minus minus OPE. This OPE is non singular. This is crucial because the splitting function here will be the complex conjugate, and we don't want to allow that. Well, I want to use this chiral algebra to, com to compute loop level quantities. So we have to include loop level corrections to these OPEs. So, as I'm sure people are very familiar with, there's a one-loop correction to the splitting function, where if, if I have these two states become collinear, 
Over here, I'll produce a negative elasticity state with a factor of 1, 2 over 1, 2 squared, like that. So this, we also have to throw into the chiral. So there's a one loop correction to the OB where J plus J plus comes one, two over one, two squared times J minus. But of course the one loop splitting function only tells me the leading order holomorphic pole. There are subleading poles. The chiral algebra needs to know about all poles. So I need to include these subleading poles in the OB as well in order to really define the chiral algebra. So what, where do those subleading poles come from? Those, those come from something a bit more complicated. If I have a diagram like this, again, this blob represents my form factor. And here I've drawn the flow of velocity. In a diagram like this, it's possible that when 1 plus and 2 plus become collinear, one gets a singularity. But this singularity is not represented by a single state anymore. It's represented by two states. So what does that mean in the chiral algebra language? It means that the OBE of J plus and J plus must have a term which is a normally ordered product of a minus and a plus. Now, if you, using various twister methods, one can compute this is the formula for what this OBE looks like. And in pictures, it's up here, I get a one plus, one minus. Um, so this should tell you that this chiral algebra is extremely complicated. You know, if you remember when you were learning 2D CFT, you might have learned about Cass Moody's, or WZW. There you have JJ goes to J. Or Vera Soro, TT goes to T, the central term. But there was also the much more complicated W algebras, where on the right-hand side of the OBE, you had normally ordered products. And there, these were much more subtle, and associativity was rather tricky to verify. So this chiral algebra will be like that. It'll be a little bit like a W algebra. And one can go even further, and you know, just by writing down the Feynman diagrams that you can write, you can in the self-field theory, there's going to be a J plus J plus goes to J minus minus, accompanied by this kind of unpleasant three-loop thing. And that's pretty hard to compute. So the key question is, do these OPEs, so we've taken the collinear singularities and translated them into operator product expansions, do they satisfy the axioms of a chiral algebra? So do they satisfy crossing symmetry or equivalently associativity? So our theorem is that if this identity holds, then yes, they do. So I'm not gonna give you anything about the proof of this theorem, we prove it using twister theory, but perhaps you could think in your head, twister theory is all about holomorphic geometry. This trace identity tells us there is no anomaly on twister space, so we have a nice theory on twister space. It's not crazy to think that you can use the holomorphic geometry of twister space to build a holomorphic chiral algebra. If this identity does not hold, then associ associativity fails. Now, this is a kind of non-trivial statement because it implies, you know, this complicated thing, oops, this complicated thing, well, it's going to be satisfy all kinds of intricate relations with, with the other OPEs. And it turns out through a result of Natalie and Victor Fernandez that this complicated OPE, OPE is, is determined just by associativity. So this tells you a lot about the structure of these very special collinear singularities. Okay. So I've spent a lot of time explaining how to translate collinear singularities into OBEs. So we wanted to, to bootstrap form factors using these techniques.
Well, form factors are going to be correlation functions of my chiral algebra. But you might notice there's something a bit funny. If I want to talk about a form factor, you, ha you have to specify a local operator. So there must be a similar this ambiguity in defining correlation functions. And there is. The most familiar chiral algebras that people study, like Virasoro, WZW, they all have states of positive conformal dimension. But with states of negative conformal, conformal weight, things work a little differently. So the correlation functions are ambiguous. That is, they're not determined by the OPEs. This is because, well, the correlation functions are some rational function of these n variables. And the conformal weight dictates the order of pole when z goes to infinity, order of pole r0. If I have negative conformal weight, w, then this is allowed to have a pole at infinity of order 2w. So to any correlation function, you can, you can add on a term which has no singularities whatsoever at zi equals zj, but it's just a polynomial in the z's as long as things have negative conformal weight. So there's lots of ambiguity in defining the correlation functions. So there's a vector space of ways of defining correlation functions. And in the math literature, this vector space is called the space of conformal blocks. So a conformal block, it's a way of giving correlation functions compatible with the conformal weights in the OPs. The next result is that these are the same as local operators of the self field theory. So if you give me a local operator in the self field QCD, then you can build a way of defining correlation functions. And further, correlation functions in that conformal block are the same as form factors. So again, I'm not going to try to tell you how to prove this. You can, you know, one can get a quite concrete handle on it by saying, like, what's the ambiguity in defining correlation functions of some operators? And by looking at the conformal weight, one kind of reads off the possible local operators. It actually can be quite concrete. In any case, this gives us a bootstrap algorithm. So we choose some local operator, say trace p squared. To recall trace p squared is good because form factors of this are amplitudes uh, of QCD that we identify the corresponding conformal block, and then we compute correlation functions using the very familiar 1980s 2D bootstrap. So let me explain how this works. So for symmetry reasons, trace p squared it has a conformal block where the two-point correlator of negative helicity gluons is 1, 2 squared. Of course, this should be a familiar expression. And it's almost a complete triviality to turn to bootstrap the endpoint tree level correlator and determine the Park Taylor formula. Why is that? We just look at this expression, and there are first order poles, but two guys become, you know, two Zs collide, which inductively reduces it to this case, and one gets to the trace order expression as this. OK, for me, this is a little boring because Park Taylor is very well known. It's much more interesting to study the loop level. So the two loop all plus form factor is the two loop correlator of the same operator, where I insert only positive velocity states. Now I'm going to compute this for gauge group SUN with special matter. And the way we do this is the familiar 1980s bootstrap. We look at the possible OPEs. It turns out the one loop and tree level OPEs are sufficient. So I get terms where tree level splitting function, one loop splitting function, 
and this quite complicated non-splitting contribution. Now, I take, I look at the, I fix one of say Z1 and I, I look at what poles does this have when it hits the other ZI? And they're determined by these three things. Now, one inductively reduces it to the case of the tree level form factor by using the one loop OPE twice. And this is, this is just pure algebra, rather tedious algebra. And here we find this answer. The two loop four point trace ordered amplitude looks like this. It's this expression. And if you stare at this, you can kind of see the different terms in the OPE. Like here is the, uh, the, the, the one loop splitting function. Here, when these are not adjacent, that comes from the non-splitting contribution. Um, and then the endpoint end single trace amplitude is this expression. You kind of park tailorize it by starting with a 4.1 and adding this, this gadget. So this is an explicit, very simple explicit formula for the two loop trace order amplitudes for any, any number of positive uh, helicity gluons. Now the double trace amplitude is being computed by, by Lance and Anthony. The triple trace amplitude vanishes. So actually, this result is available in full color, but only with this weird matter, weird matter content. Okay. So I, I didn't, um, I didn't give any proofs because I thought, you know, this kind of, this kind of audience doesn't want math. They want, you know, something more concrete. So there's some forthcoming work of Lance and Anthony, which I'm very excited by, which set out to check if this formula on the previous slide actually matches what one computes by standard techniques. Well, they use the techniques in these kind of classic amplitudes papers from the early 2000s. Of course, in these papers, they didn't you know, have this weird matter content, so they had to be tweaked a little bit. And what they found was, yes, it matches, but there's a subtlety about dim reg. So one conclusion of their paper is that dim reg is not a good thing to do when you're st starting with self-dual QCD because self-duality is very tied to dimension four and these kind of arguments don't work in dimension four plus epsilon. So in, if, if you use dim reg, they found there are IRO divergences. It's not entirely finite and rational, but the chiral algebra formula completes the finite part. If you use a mass regulator, then there are no IRO divergences and the match is exact. So for me, this is, you know, pretty non-trivial check because there's like a bunch of terms and a bunch of free parameters and they all, they all match. Okay, so I'm gonna spend a little time on generalizations. I don't think I'm gonna to get to everything I wanted to say, but one can try to go further. Well, to go further, we need knowledge of OPEs beyond one loop. So there's a lovely paper by Keiyu Zeng where he computes all of the OPEs in the supersymmetric case, just explicitly. And there's some lovely formula in terms of Clefsch Gordon coefficients. And then Paquette and Fernandez show that they're all determined by, a, by associativity. However, even knowing the OPEs, you know, the bootstrap method is quite is reasonably complicated. You know, it's not too complicated that I couldn't implement it on pencil and paper. Um, but it's, it's complicated enough that I wouldn't want to go further with pencil and paper personally, although maybe other people would. Um, of course, it's infinitely simpler than Feynman diagrams. So yeah, there's really no serious obstruction to computing, say, three-loop form factors of trace B cubed, except somebody you know, having, having the energy to do it. We, what we'd really like to do is compute what happens with multi-point insertions. That's currently out of reach. Um, let me also quickly mention, there's some lovely work of Biddleston, Sharma, and Skinner, where they see what happens with gravity. Uh, there one has um, 
slightly different anomaly cancellation conditions, which are listed here, when there's pure gauge, pure gravity and mixed anomalies, so there's three conditions, when this, these anomalies cancel, there is a chiral algebra include incorporating loop level corrections. The problem is we can't run this program because there's no local operators in the theory. Okay, let's see. Uh, maybe I, I wanna quickly advertise some other fun computations. There's some similar computations for scattering amplitudes and flavor symmetry backgrounds we were able to do using the methods and we get some kind of, yeah, I find this stuff really fun. We get some nice formulas. For example, we found this nice kind of hypergeometric series formula for the following expression. I have a look, just a, an operator located at a point in, source, in space time, which sources a photon, self dual photon. And then I consider scattering you know, a bunch of say two fermions and some arbitrary number of gluons in this background. And we get these beautiful hypergeometric series. I, don't know. I thought this was kind of fun. Um, so there's many, many similar computations you can do which give these exact results. Okay. So the summary with special matter content, um, certain form factors are computed by a chiral algebra. There's this leads to new computations at loop level, and there's many, many more amplitudes and form factors that this approach can, in principle, compute. So, okay, well, let's stop there. Thank you for the very nice talk. Questions, please. Um, so self-dual Yang-Mills is related to self-dual gravity by the double copy. Um, so I wondered if you had any thoughts about looking at gravity. Yeah, I mean, I did mention this work of Roland and, and, and Atul over here, but we, we couldn't... I mean, at, at tree level with these chiral algebras, there's some very naive things you can do. You replace the commutator by the Poisson bracket. But, but at loop level, eh, eh, the gravity loop corrected gravity OPs are very complicated and we don't see any see how to do that. Okay, thanks. Thanks for the nice talk, Kevin. Yeah. The you mentioned this uh, sort of subleading term in the OP that has only a single one two in the denominator. Mm -hmm. uh, issues like that were sort of a little bit of a stumbling block when we were trying to uh, apply a rational recursion relation for general uh, QCD loop amplitude. So I don't know what you think about the prospects for uh, you know, evaluating that more systematically. You mentioned it was hard, but it depends on how hard I get. How do you mean like be beyond one loop, for instance, or? I even just at one loop, uh, you know, understanding, uh, you, you can do a BCFW recursion relation and one of the pieces of information you need to know is what's the behavior near this double pole. And you want to take a residue, so you have to understand the single pole under the double pole. Yes. And so the question is, could you understand that more systematically? Because we could kind of under make up rules in simple cases, but we didn't have it very systematic. Well, in, in, in these cases where the, um, the twister space anomaly cancels, you can do, it, we, we can, either by saying, that's determined by associativity, which is some algebra, or you can or you can do some nice computations directly on twister space of, of some, some Feynman diagrams. And either, either way, you get the same answer. And, but in the more general case, when the twister space anomaly does not cancel, we don't. So, I mean, in, in a sense, the chiral algebra is, is, is like, it's very like BCFW, but in situations where it works better at loop level. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Thanks for a nice talk. Um, maybe I missed this, but you mentioned this multi-point trace B squared correlated. What do this compute in the uh, amplitudes language? Uh, so, so the the, the, the multi-point correlators, what do they compute? Um, multi-point uh, like the number of, of insertions 
uh, is just the number of external states. So an endpoint correlator is like an n gluon amplitude. Okay, thanks. Oh, those, oh, sorry. Yeah, 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 yeah. sorry. I, I, I went a bit too quickly over that. That was, um, suppose you wanted to compute three loop all plus amplitudes, then you would need to have two copies of trace P squared to, to get the relevant diagrams. Uh, so we can't currently do that because you have to integrate over the position of the operators. It's a bit tricky. Okay, thanks. Uh, I also have a question. Uh, so at one loop in usual, well, let's say self Julian Mills, uh, there is a very nice formula for the one loop, same helicity amplitude. Uh, but do I understand correctly that this formula plays no no role or you, could, you cannot reproduce this formula using your formalism because it's canceled, this, this amplitude yeah. is zero. It's canceled, it, I mean, in, in this, I mean, there is some other, if there's some other anomaly cancellation mechanism, which I didn't mention, which is a kind of green Schwartz mechanism where the one loop anomaly is canceled by a tree level, like tree level exchange. And in that mechanism, you can reduce the form. You can find that formula by studying a tree level diagrams, which cancel it. But in terms of Kaya algebra, and yeah, this we formula can, has, no, no, has, we can compute it. We can, we can compute. Yeah. Okay. And maybe, but, but it's like, it's not, it's a little convoluted, but we can. Maybe another question. Uh, so what, how would you say in your formalism, integrability of self dual Mills gets encoded? Is it correct to think that this is just the chiral, chiral algebra? That, that's, yes. That's the... uh, so in, in my perspective, this chiral, you know, if we look at familiar 2D integrability has a Yangian symmetry, and this chiral algebra is like the analog of the Yangian in this context. Okay, yeah, thank you. Well, well let's thank the speaker again. Yeah.